everybody. Hello. I want to give you all a very warm welcome to the EarthCon uh, kickoff here at Campus Party. Uh, EarthCon is a, a worldwide uh, organization, and this is actually the first year uh, that they're active. Um, EarthCon uh, is an organization with people that are trying to link and connect and empower people that are working uh, on climate change. Climate change is such a dangerous and important problem of our time and we really uh, all need to work together to find a solution which gives uh, me a great link to our speaker, uh, Tom Huizer. Tom uh, went to Greenland to do research about climate change and what he saw there really shocked him. Uh, the way the country is changing is really yeah, devastating and shows how, how big a problem climate change actually is. Um, what Tom does now is he works for uh, Kick Inno Energy, which is a company that supports renewable energy startups. And uh, Tom will tell us uh, about um, what he thinks is a very important solution uh, to this climate change problem, which is uh, the power of collaboration. How uh, we are all uh, part of creating climate change and we should all be a part of the solution. So, Tom. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm personally really honored to, to stand here in front of you today. Um, just for me to get a grasp of who's in the audience. Um, are you guys like, who's working in the energy or renewable energy field or climate change related? Nobody? All right, like two? Okay, well uh, that's good, that's fine. Um, so what I would like to talk to you about today is climate change and the power of collaboration. And I would like to illustrate that to you by telling you a very personal story uh, about the most beautiful place that I've ever seen in my whole life and it was already introduced to me that is Greenland. For me it was the summer of 2014 at the time I was living in sunny Barcelona it was great weather but I decided to move to move to Greenland so on one day I took a plane from Barcelona to Copenhagen and from Copenhagen I flew to the International Airport of Greenland, which I can tell you is probably the smallest international airport you'll ever see. But as soon as I got out of that airplane, this is what I saw. Most beautiful landscape that I've ever seen. This landscape full of ice and snow, as far as the eye could see. But I did not just go there to take this beautiful picture. I went there to join a glacier expedition. Because together with a group of 16 scientists, we would be there to study this remote glacier for effects of climate change. So in the first week when I got there, we, we prepared a mission. Um, you have to realize it's quite a dangerous, dangerous area to be in. We might have a polar bear here, but of course they are there as well. Um, so we prepared a mission, we got food and equipment, tents together. And then in the second week, we were dropped off at this remote place. And that was it. For one month, we would be at that location studying climate change. So we got there, we set up our camp, and just to paint the picture a little bit, uh, we had a camp with two big white tents in which we stored our food and equipment. And around that tent, we had smaller tents, just like you have for a campus party where we in which we slept. So we built up our camp, and then from that day on, every day we would hike up towards this glacier, which you have to realize is about two, three hours of a hike away. And then as soon as we got towards that glacier, this is what it looked like. We unloaded our equipment and we did our measurements. So what we did on that glacier is we, we probed it, this was us. You can see how small we are compared to that massive glacier, but we probed it at different locations. And by doing that at different times, we can say something about how the climate change is evolving or affecting the area over there. So every day we hiked up towards this glacier, we did our measurements and often when we came back after a long day of hard work, we were so tired, so tired. We often took a nap in the sun. We had food and went straight to bed just to prepare for the next day. But in the third week, something happened. After a long day of hard work at the glacier, we came back towards the camp and in the valley, this is what we saw. From the distance, thick clouds were coming in. And we were a bit worried, so we got on the satellite phone, which was our only connection to the outside world and asked them what is up with this storm. And they said, oh guys, better prepare yourself because this is serious. So 
that's what we did. We prepared ourselves, we tied everything down in the camp and just hoped that the storm somehow wouldn't be so bad. But it was. That night, in the middle of the night, we were woken up by a watchman and he said, tent in the air, tent in the air, everybody out now. And then full of adrenaline, you wake up and you look outside of your tent and the first thing you see is two guys hanging onto the tent that has all our equipment. So you rush outside of the tent and through the wind, the storm, the rain, you hear them scream, get some stones, get some stones. So with all the adrenaline, the power you have in your body, you find the biggest stone you can find, you rush back towards that tent and you put them on top just to make sure it does not fly away. And as we were doing that, the second tent that has all our food was hit by a gust of wind. And you can imagine that one was even more important. So we do the same thing with that one. We put stones on top, but it wasn't enough. So somebody dives in towards that tent, gets down the pole that is holding up the tent, and at that point, the tent is no longer a tent. It's just a tarp covering all our stuff. So for about half an hour, we battled the storm, and at that point, that was all we could do. We decided to go back to the tents that were still standing up, catch some sleep, and then just hope that the next morning we could somehow rebuild the camp. So the next morning when we woke up, it was silence. The storm moved away, but it left its marks on the camp. Everything was wet, the tents were down, and at that point we decided that it didn't make too much sense to continue the mission to study the ice, but priority one would be to rebuild. So somebody volunteered and he said, let me rebuilt the tents because we need a roof over our head. And somebody else volunteered and said, let me go fish so that we can foo- have food in our bellies by the end of the day. And somebody else volunteered and he said, man, my clothes, everything is so wet, let me build a fire so that we can dry ourselves. So everybody went to do something and it's sort of a miracle. By the end of the day, the camp was fully rebuilt. We had food in our bellies, the tents were there again. And we built a campfire to warm ourselves. At that point, we were so happy. And we were discussing the irony of the situation that the massive storm that hit us that night could have been aggravated by climate change. And then it hit me. What we experienced that night is the same thing that the world is experiencing today. Because that night, we were hit by a storm, an unusual storm. And we see this is happening all over the world as well. We see that climate change is setting off storms that are bigger and more frequent than we've seen before. And this all has to do with what we do with the CO2 levels in our atmosphere. I saw not too many people of you raise your hands when, when I ask you whether you work in the field of climate change or renewable energy. But you might have seen this graph, a graph that shows that from way, way, way back, Up until a few decades ago, the carbon levels in our atmosphere have always hovered somewhere between 180 and 280 parts per million. This went up, it went down, but it always went between these two lines. And we see that since the Industrial Revolution, that peak is going up. And it's going up dramatically. And the fear is that the temperature will go up with it. And you might have seen it on the news, but recently in Paris, we agreed upon setting a level which we cannot go beyond, two degrees. And in order to make that level, we need to mitigate, we need to stop at 450 parts per million. In 2014, we were at 400. And the issue with climate change is is that it's not only affecting us, but it's affecting the people that are not causing the problem in the first place. We see that the most effect of climate change, these stronger storms, this increase of sea level rise, is most affecting the countries that don't have the ability to do something about it. I like to use the reference, we are here today in the Netherlands, and I don't know how many of you are internationals, but half the country of the Netherlands is below sea level. Thanks to the dikes and the protection that we have at our coast, we can be here in Utrecht dry, let's say. But if those dikes weren't there, it would be Utrecht by the beach. We have the opportunity, we have the chance, we have the money and the ability to do something here in the Netherlands about protecting ourselves. But this is not possible 
in the poorest country in the world. And we see this, we see this happening in the news. For instance, recently, I think it was last week, in India, we hit 51 degrees Celsius, a record temperature that we've never seen before. And I'd like to use at this point a reference towards the story I was telling you about Greenland. There, a storm hit us that almost destroyed our house. And this is not too far-fetched. This is happening all over the world now, that these massive storms, they are affecting, they're forcing people to move out of their house. Think of the people in Bangladesh that see the sea level rise and as a result of it have to move. Or think of the drought that is now going on in the south of Africa, where people basically don't have anywhere to go. And at this point, I always get terrified. But I believe this is not the solution. We all saw the presentations like this, like the one of Al Gore, very important, but also very scary. But I believe there is also a solution. And that solution I saw back in Greenland. A solution that I like to call the power of collaboration. Because that night in Greenland, we were hit by a storm. We panicked for a bit because our livelihood was threatened by something that we never seen before. But by working together, using the power of collaboration, we can battle any storm. Thank you. Can, I can you switch it back on? Yeah, thank you. Now, I would like to put these words into practice with you, and I think that's also where EarthCon is standing for. We are here at Campus Party. I just arrived this morning, and I've been walking around, and I think the power of collaboration really is resembled here at Campus Party. We see people from all over the world, different nationalities, backgrounds, working together to tackle one of the biggest problems. So I would like to encourage you, EarthCon is organizing a, a hackathon on Saturday. So if you're interested in putting this into action, the power of collaboration, I would kindly ask you to join and help us with the energy challenge on Saturday. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, of course you can ask, that's fine. Sure. Hello, okay. Hi. Can, can you give an example of uh, a collaboration that has been effective, like other than this one, but uh, wi while tackling climate change? Sure. Um, I recently graduated from the University of Eindhoven, and there together with a group of students, we got together and we uh, set up a, uh, an organization called Teen Energy. Uh, and when we started, it was just three of us, um, and now we are growing bigger and bigger, and our aim is to accelerate the energy challenge in Eindhoven. So we started off very small, uh, with a small get-togethers in a bar in Eindhoven, and it grew bigger and bigger. And now in June, we are organizing the biggest and the first energy conference in Eindhoven, where we bring together all the stakeholders of the renewable energy world. So you see that by working together, it really is motivating and exciting to do something about climate change, because really the question is too big to solve on your own. And by doing it together, it's not only more fun, but it will only make it easier and more motivating to do something about it. So I think especially when you talk in terms of communities, I think that is could be a very nice example of the power of collaboration. And it works, on, it works on many levels. You could think of what we do here today, of getting together and trying to tackle the problems that we see today. That could be an option. It could be team energy, which I just talked about, or it can be as simple as neighbors in a, in a neighborhood that work together and say, okay, hey, let's try to make our neighborhood a bit more greener. Let's put solar panels on the rooftop. If you do it together, that makes it so much more impactful. Ah. Um, I've heard the argument that um, people cooking with um, firewood and coal in developing countries also contribute a lot of CO2 to the atmosphere. How, how true are, are those claims? 
Yeah, um, sure, they contribute. Um, but let me point out an even more problematic issue that comes with cooking on, on these fuels is that um, these people in developing countries, they are so limited in resources. And the reason that they cook on these fuels is that wood and charcoal, they can either find them themselves or produce them themselves. And in order to cook, that's what they use. And they use it indoors. So the pollution that comes free with that causes a lot of health issues. And these health issues are, are an even bigger burden or a more even bigger result of burning these fuels than it is towards our climate. Um, so no matter whether you see it as a problem of health or no matter where you see it as a problem of climate change, it is definitely a problem that needs to be tackled. And you see it happening um, bit by bit when you ter talk in terms of electrifying the developed world, the d underdeveloped world. You see a lot of initiatives of small grids, energy grids that are being built there. But in terms of heat for cooking, that's still a massive issue to solve. Because for cooking, it's difficult because you need a massive amount of heat for cooking. It's hard to store and it's, uh, it's quite expensive at the moment. So this is definitely an issue that, that, that it needs some attention. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so you mentioned that we're currently at 400 CO2 particles per, I don't know what the term million. was, per million. Yeah. Thank you. And that uh, we can only go to 450 if we want to keep the temperature increase at 2 degrees. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So if we stay at the current, well, what we're doing now, how long will it take to actually go to the 450? Um, honestly, I, I, ca I can't give you the exact number, okay. but it's going so fast. It's going really fast. Um, I see you're, you're raising your hand, maybe you know, but um, uh, yeah. Well, I also don't know the exact answer, but there are a lot of feedback mechanisms that make uh, the, the, the heat go up and the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere go up faster, like ice melting. Uh, there's a lot of methane in, in ice, yeah. right? And uh, if the ice melts, the methane comes free, and methane is like 25 times more warming than CO2. So yeah, mechanisms like that will make it go up uh, like faster. Yeah, just to put it more into, num into numbers for you, um, we already went up 0 0.8 degrees on average globally. Um, and the thing with CO2 is once you put it in the atmosphere, it stays there for a bit. So the effect, you'll see it a bit later. So that's why we want to mitigate it for 50. And that's already quite soon. Um, I'm just wondering, what have you done exactly with uh, your company, uh, Kick Eno Energy? Uh, like, how, uh, like, how has that been kind of the product of your inspiration and your time in Greenland and everything? Sure, sure. Um, I'm, a, I'm an engineer by trade. Um, so what we do with Kick Eno Energy um, is we support energy startups all the way from classroom to first customer. So what we see in order to make that switch from oil to renewables, we have a lot of new ideas that collaboratively need to replace those fossil fuels. So what we do with Kick Inner Energy, we nurture, we support those energy startups, and we do that in terms of team. We give them su team support. We financially support them. We support them to, to develop the technology, and we help them with finding a good market by marketing their product. So we essentially, you can see it as an inc as a accelerator, incubator program for energy startups. And that's what now I'm doing in my daily life. Uh. Cool. Um, yeah, I have a question about the role of uh, big fossil fuel companies. How do you see them in the collaboration towards the solution? That's a good, <laughs> that's a good question. It's a, it's a tough question that I first it's a question I find tough to answer. Um, in my opinion, these oil companies are switching too slow. Um, recently, uh, Shell had a, uh, a stakeholder meeting in, uh, I think it was, I think it was in the Netherlands actually, where there was raised the question: Should Shell invest more or switch towards renewable energies? And I think the result was only two percent of people that voted yes. Um, I think Shell, for instance, in this, let, I don't want to point specifically at Shell, but in this case, we are moving so slow. I think 
urgency is, is a problem here to, to make that realization. And for Shell, I get it. It's very easy and tempting to stay with the money of oil that is still there. But if we want to if we want to make this, we got we got to go faster. We got to go faster. And um, I think bottom up, a lot of things are happening. And I think if Shell, for instance, or any other oil company stays at the course that they are now, they will be out of business in 50 years. And let me tell you why. The power of collaboration not only applies to us today, but we see it also in the solution where we go to in terms of renewable energy. We see that no longer energy is supplied from a central point of view, but it's going to more towards a collaborative system, a cooperative system where everybody has these collectors on their rooftop, where we connect everything in one grid, let's say, of smaller entities that work together to produce the energy we need. And if you remain rigid in a centralized solution, then at some point you go out of business. Okay, so are there any other questions or is there any way, do you have a link to, yeah? In the back, there's one. Hi, Hi. Uh, I would like to know about, I mean, when I, I have think a lot about this kind of, of things and this is a little bit interesting, but my, my main problem here is that I don't know if you believe or, or if we should trust uh, our governments to know that they're doing the best they can in order to help us to solve this problem. Maybe on the front they can or they could, but I believe we are forgetting that at some point being greedless it's something they don't want at all. They don't want to not know what do we do, how do we do it, or when do we do it. Not in a bad sense of conspirational mm -hmm. or, or spying, but in the end, big cities are big cities because they, they had electricity first than the rest of them. And that's a big city. What, what's, that's why today we have big cities because it's very, it was very hard to have electricity on a town and it was very easy to have it on a city. <coughs> So at this point, I am <coughs> sorry. I'm not very sure about what to do and how, you know, like lowering the CO2 uh, levels will help at all in these kind of things. If at the end, the only thing that matters is money at all costs in all the senses. Yeah. I mean, Shell, in, for example, in Spain, I don't know if you know a company called, uh, I, I don't know, Repsol. Yeah. Repsol started to invest on aero generators, okay, because they sell them. Yeah. Literally, a Spain food generators because Repsol sell eat sell them to Spain, and they made an arrangement in which I sell it, I produce it, and I take the energy. And Spain say, okay, it's cheaper than the competency, so okay, let's do it. But in the end, Repsol is not doing Greenpeace favors; it's just making money for sure. Yeah. And the big problem of all this is that, uh, at least from my point of view, and I would like to know your, your opinion about it, is how can we do it more profitable for them? If we really want to save our planet, we should make it profitable for them, not for us. And that is very sad, but it's yeah. how we live. We always need to pay taxes at the end, and it, that is sad too. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, good, good question. Um, should we trust their governments in, in general? Yeah, I believe we should trust them. But are they doing enough? Um, I don't think so. Um, take the example of the Netherlands. Um, we always try to say we are at the forefront of innovation in the Netherlands. We all we do so well. But in terms of renewable energies, we're the worst kid in the class in Europe. Um, so should we trust them? Yes, I think we should trust them. But we should encourage them to do more. Uh, and in that lies also a challenge for us. What we, what I believe is that if you look, is it a responsible responsibility of the government? Is it a responsibility of Shell? Is it a responsibility of us? I believe it's the responsibility of all of us. And it sounds a bit cheesy maybe, but in order to to get this going, we should also start ourselves. Um, and yeah, it's easy to wait for companies like Shell to change, but as you 
apps or web services, as you say, that's that's quite difficult because they are they're running on money, and they will do for a, for a long, long time. Um, but you have to realize that also oil is no longer too much profitable. Let let's say, because the biggest subsidized commodity in the world is oil. So there are a lot of pol pol political things at play that are not in favor of renewable energies, but if we as a community show that, man, this is really what we want to go to, they have to follow. Because in the end, if we decide that we want to go green, that we want to go renewable, they go out of business. And, and that lies a key, I think. Sure. Hello? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you have heard about um, Spain political situation nowadays recently, but recently, about two or three months ago, they put a tax to the sun. Four years ago, a lot of people invest a lot of money on, on, on solar plants, yeah. okay? Maybe you had a, a, a some, some place in that in the past you put some olive oils, uh, olive uh, olives, but now it's too dry, so you cannot keep planting, so you use it for this. Yeah. And they invest like literally hundreds of thousands of euros to start selling it to the companies, yeah. you know, to the grid. And two months ago, there was approved uh, a law of tax to them, so they will have to pay for selling that energy, wi which in the main case is for personal use. So from the 100% they get, they only get a, t uh, they, they get from the sun, they get like a 25% because they sell 50 and they have to pay 25 or 30 at some point and they still need to pay their taxes for their own ener electricity. So that's what I'm telling you yeah. at some point, that is an, a measure that the, 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 electri the electric companies made to the government and the government to us in order to not help, not let us do that, and that's that's my point of not trusting any government, yeah. not, not not trusting them, but how we don't have the the tools to really demand what 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 we want because they have the power to do it, and that is not something that cares to the immersed majority. To immersed majority, something that matters is money, yeah. job, um, health, but this is not really their most important thing because they don't see the cloud every day every day over their city. But uh. and that, that's my question. I mean, I, you, I cannot trust my government in those cases because I wanted to put one, and some advisors told me, don't do it because the government is not going to allow this. Three years after, they do it, and it's like very devastating to see how many people invest and they have, they have money from the bank, and they have no money. They can't they can give back the, the, the mortgage because they are not getting enough money when they were once supposed to have. And that's that's completely devastating. Yeah. And that's my point. I mean, how do we make this profitable in in the in the midterm, not even short term? How do we make this profitable? The big thing is that they invest thousands of millions to have petrol go uh, g getting out, and until they profitable, and until they rentalize that investment, we are fucked because they wanna they wanna yeah. steal, yeah. asking to their governments to that government in that country to keep doing it, no? Sorry. Yeah. I don't know if the governments are the problem. Maybe the consumer is uh, the one who pays in the end. And the consumer is the one who pays to the investor. And if the big company, if the consumer doesn't want to pay the extra euro for products that were uh, produced sustainably, then uh, then the it can be profitable. So they're going to keep uh, producing uh, un environmentally unfriendly. Yeah. I, I, I have just told that if you in if you install your own solar panel in your home, it's more expensive, really, really more expensive because of a tax, not because of the product, to do it than to use the normal electric system. So nobody in their own mind would pay more money to do less. That's, 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 that's not profitable. Nobody can live with that. I'm not gonna, w if I want to do that, I go to a cabin in the woods and don't use electricity yeah. or use the less electricity that I can. But if, if it's like 10 times using a panel, so a solar panel or the electric grid, I don't believe anybody in their own mind would do it or we would all be doing it. Yeah, it's, 
it's it's such a difficult. I I completely understand your point. Um, the, the 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 problem is that I s I see both of your argument, right? I mean, I understand yours. You're completely right. I mean, the people that have so many other priorities and problems in their life that climate change, they don't see it now. It's happening something in the future. So why let's solve the problems that we have now, especially in Spain with the unemployment. Let's solve them first, right? I also see your problem. It's like, man, if we don't buy the sustainable project products, then yeah, why should the producer make them at all? Um, I don't, I don't have the solution. I would love to give it to you. Um, I think we need some sort of a threshold uh, in which, that which we have to somehow step over, in which we have enough people that say, okay, I want these sustainable products. And then the realization of the companies that you talk about say, hey, man, we see the switch happening. We have to jump on the bandwagon, let's say. Uh, and just to refer to my speech, in order to m get that critical mass, we need the communities. We need people together to stand up. Because if you're going to do it alone, then you're not going to reach that critical mass. And you're not going to have enough money to, to battle, battle the system, let's say. So by doing it together, by creating this sort of mass against what is happening now. I think, in, in my view, that's the way to go. But it's difficult. It's so difficult. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. sure. Hello. Uh, yeah, well, one more point about our governments. Um, <laughs> I, I think, uh, like, during the Paris uh, conference, um, the, the agreement was, was presented as being a such a historical agreement and like, whoa, 1.5 degrees, this is what we never could have imagined. But at the same time, it said so little about fair trade agreements, about uh, who, who should do what, what happens if it doesn't, if no one does anything. So I don't know, I want to, I want to sort of propose a, a thir uh, well, uh, another uh, solution or way to, to really get, get things going, which is um, civil disobedience. Uh, two weeks ago, about 4,000 people uh, occupied a brown, uh, a lignite mine. Lignite is a very, very, very dirty fossil fuel. Uh, um, a lignite mine in Germany, and they occupied it for 48 hours, which made a gigantic statement towards the government and towards the fossil fuel companies. And uh, I feel that we need this as well. I mean, we need the renewable energy sector to really get, get going, but we also need to show that, no, we don't want coal, we don't want oil. We don't need it. We we have we have renewable energy. So why why can companies still make so much money off of something which we know is killing us? It it doesn't make any sense. We feel like we should take it a step further. Yeah, sure. That that's the whole problem. We still need oil because like ninety percent of all cars and trucks are fueled by oil. And they're needed to deliver all the food and all the water to all the people around the world. So we do need oil, and we will need it for tens and tens of, of years until uh, alternative energy sources become profitable. But until that time, with our growing population, we, we still do need oil. It will take tens and tens of years to transfer all cars which now run on, on oil to renewable en energy sources. And have you heard about Telsa? Tesla, sorry, Tesla. Yeah. Do you know? <coughs> have you have you seen their 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 showcase that they did last year for for portable batteries in each house, yeah. in each place? Yeah. So do you know that with with the money that the world is spent each two years in renewing their cars, we could get off the grid completely in one year. With that same money, it was like twenty two billion dollars yeah. yeah. around the world. That's what people spend in buying cars every year, all the car, all the world. With that same money, we could get completely off the grid, buying cars for everyone, having free electricity for everyone, killing nuclear blasts, killing gas, killing oil, killing wars between Russia and Europe for oil, for gas. We will kill everything. With two years of buying cars, every people, we could get completely off the grid. So we don't need tens and tens of years literally yeah. to buy it because it's not money it's that they get they lost tens of tens of years of money if that's, you look, if that's, you that's the, mo that's the add, point to add to that if you look now at the investments that are needed to get about to still get the oil out of the ground 
We still have enough oil, but it's getting more difficult to get it out of the ground. We need about a new Iran every year to put it to numbers. But the investments needed to get it out of the ground, they are so massive, if we just switch them to renewables in a few years, that's it. W why do you guys think we, we don't do that? Uh, money? The, I mean, the, 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 thing is, the thing is, if you look at these, these companies, the investments for the future, they are massive. But in if you look at the history, they're invested already so much money that they still have to make a return on it. And then that lies, lies the problem. So the problem is that, uh, like the traditional companies, which, which have uh, uh, oil-fueled uh, transport vehicles, they still have too much invested in the, in the current base of production, so they won't switch to renewable energy. Uh, um, it could be, but then again, you come to you, you, you could come again to the same discussion we had before, and that is if we as citizens keep on be agreeing with uh, with these polluting fuels, then also for them there will never be a drive to change. So it's that's why I keep on getting back to to the power of collaboration. Is that um, it's not as black and white as saying it's the companies or it's the government or it's it's us that have to do something. We have to do it together, and that's the most difficult part for sure. Yeah, but the, but the, the but the point, the problem with the companies is that the companies which have the money now, they do the most is lobbying now, yeah. especially in America. Absolutely, yeah. And with all this lobbying, they are going to influence the politicians who sit in Paris together to make all these kinds of rubbish plans, maybe. True, but on the but other, uh, but but then in in the ultimate end it is the consumer who pays those traditional companies and makes their return on investment and gives them money to lobby so i think in the ultimate end it has to start with the consumer getting more long term mm -hmm. sided and not so short sided yeah. i'm not i'm not completely agree with you because if you look at um, at um, exxon mobil recently released a uh, a report public report in which they say that they already n sorry Ah, you can hear me? Maybe I have to go back. They recently published a report in which they stated that already in 1990 they knew about the devastating effects of burning oil for climate change. So I also, in my opinion, they have a responsibility there to educate people. I think you want to wrap up, if I'm correct? Yep. All right, good. So uh, again, just from my point of view, and then I give the word to you. Um, I really like these discussions. If you really enjoy them, uh, join the hackathon on Saturday. Then we will think about this global issue of how to solve it. We will specifically talk about save it forward, in which we consider what if we envision it, what if we had a global battery in which we can store the extra energy that we have here in the West and maybe let people in the South, in the underdeveloped countries use it. So that's a very interesting concept and maybe we can, together with your skills, make something awesome happening. Um, okay, that's so from my side. Yeah, thank you all very much for listening and coming and having a discussion. I think if people are interested, we will continue this discussion uh, for as long as we want. And I want to give Tom a really big applause and thank you for coming. <laughs>